I yeah, could put it back on the door here, back so here, I guess, guess, or out in the shed. Wherever you want to put it, I'll just tell her that's where it'll be. I did get it from the shed. I'll put it back here by the back door. All right. She doesn't come to my group anymore. All right. She seems to work on Thursday nights. Must be an we are now live, I believe. So let's pray. God, we thank you for calling us together, for joining us when we study, for speaking to us through your word and through the spirit that works within us. And so we ask as we invite you to be a part of this conversation and this gathering, we ask that you would guide our hearts and open our minds that we might find the truth that you have for each one of us according to your perfect will and not our imperfect understanding. We thank you for that. Amen. Well, a couple of fun chapters. As, we, as we've said a couple of times, we're now, Paul's nearing the end. And he's about to, next chapter, he hops on a boat. This chapter, he gets stuck. I love the boat. <laughs> you know, if you look, and it's interesting, if you look at just the region, you know, the, diff, the distance between where he is in Caesarea and then even leaving from there to get to Rome, um, it's a long way. And although some of his missionary work has worked up into, um, you know, I guess what we would call now the Middle East or Greece, Turkey, that area, um, it's still a long way away from Rome. Um, and, you know, although we know Peter and some of the disciples were probably comfortable with boats and sailing, um, we don't really know much about Paul's comfort level with it, but we know he really probably wouldn't have gotten there without a boat. It isn't, it, and the boat ride's not going to be like a you know, carnival cruise. <laughs> <laughs> they give you an oar. Cor closer to the Costa Concordia, but anyway. Um, so, so things are stacking up, and and part of what happens toward the end of Acts is it's it's like a train. The locomotive has has begun to break, and all the cars are kind of compressing. The timing in in Acts is now getting really condensed. Um, there's a lot happening, and and we're covering a lot of distance and a lot of time because it's you know for in, he's he's in captivity for a couple of years. There's not a whole lot to write about. Like okay, this happened again today, again today. <laughs> so so he's not he's not moving around. But one of the things that we to be aware of is the impact that his time in captivity had because as we've talked about he indicates that you know it gave him a chance to speak to those who were his captors and so w while we don't see him moving through a lot of different places uh, at the at the back end of at the toward the end of his missionary career he's planting probably some very very deep seeds in the lives of the people that are around him because he's spending a lot of time with them. And, and so, and, and their ability to, to witness to the gospel as, as they've heard from him, um, you know, there's a, a commentator, William Barclay, who's in English, talks about, uh, there was an, a, a, an, an evangelist in England that was, can't remember the guy's name now, but very popular and, and was kind of a traveling evangelist and, but, and was a man that had led a pretty rotten life before he gave his life to Christ. And, and there was a lot of controversy around him, and he was getting ready to preach in one place, and um, he got a letter from somebody threatening him, saying, I know all about your past, and if, you, and if you choose to get in this pulpit, I will attend worship service, and I will call you out in public and tell everybody everything that you've done, so don't go in. Um, he, he received that letter, I think, hand-delivered on the day of or maybe the day before he was going in. So he took the letter in, went into the pulpit, read the letter, and said, yes, that's the guy I was. This is the guy I am, and Jesus can do that for you too. And he had huge conversions because he was honest. And that's one of the things that we see in, in the New Testament and especially in great relief in Paul. We see this. You know, one of the remarkable things about the characters we find in the in the early church, in the New Testament, and, and it's true in the Old Testament as well, but we, I think we can relate to them a little bit more in the New Testament. They're not great people to begin with. 
but they're honest about where they've come from. They've, they're honest about their preconceptions, their, their messed up motivations, their, their, you know, their little arguments. And, you know, if every single letter in the New Testament has some kind of conflict revealed, both in, either internally or in dealing with heresies from the outside. I mean, it's, it's not, this is not like Mormonism, where everybody is lockstep in, in, in the same, you know, mantra, the same belief, the same behavior. We get pictures of people that are very real. Paul tells his story. He says, listen, I, I was guilty of murder. I was as guilty as anybody else, you know, and, and I, I did these things, which are which in Christ set up the stage for what, what really happens when we give our lives to Christ. What really happens? What is, what is salvation about? What is redemption about? And, and I, I think Paul and, and the early, you know, the, the, the figures we know from the early church, but in this case, Paul in particular, um, help us understand what Jesus does not do is come in and make us little clay models of the people we're supposed to be. We talk about surrender. We talk about Christ transforming. He is not asking us to abdicate who we are. He's not asking us to stop doing and stop being. He's offering to in, empower us with the gifts that we currently have that, we are, that are misguided and ill-focused, but more importantly, to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. I mean, that's the, the primary impact of Jesus Christ in the life of a believer when we give our lives to Christ. The primary impact is to accomplish in us what we could never accomplish ourselves, what we need supernatural help for, what we need the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's unique and different for every one of us. I think that's part of why, you know, God's plan for salvation begins with creation and law. But in, for us, you know, it really comes into play with Christ. But Christ is one person. And because he was a real person, everybody wouldn't be like him. Everybody wouldn't have been a, a man. Everybody would not have been born to a carpenter. Everybody wouldn't have the same Jewish upbringing that he did. So his ability to connect with people on a personal basis would have been limited. Just like we see with Paul and, and Peter, Paul and John Mark and Barnabas. They don't all see everything together. But because the Holy Spirit is the binding force. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a distinct personality other than sanctifying. The Holy Spirit is that power that makes witnessing possible. Wait here until the Father sends the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will come on you with power, and then you'll go and be witnesses. And it's and Jesus alludes to this in John chapter, with the end of John, starting in 15. He alludes to the, the disciples are asking, wait, where are you going? What's going to happen? Because he's, you know, he's alluding to his eminent crucifixion and resurrection. Um, and whether they were just obtuse or fr frightened or whatever, they want to know where he's going. And he says, listen, you can't go where I'm going. But when I leave, and I won't be with you forever, the Father will send the comfort of the Holy Spirit to draw alongside you and guide you in all the things that you need to do. That's critical because in the truth of his incarnation, his limitation is one person in one place at one time and and not not able to capture the heart of somebody who's not like him. And because heart change is what we're looking for, it's the Holy Spirit that makes that possible. And when the Holy Spirit steps into your life, you're able to say the truth. Yes, that's the way I was. And and it's a powerful thing to say that's the way I was because it, it allows other people to see that God can change us because the changes, I, I still remember when I, I went to church all of my life and I enjoyed it. When I was in college, I learned that you could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I made that decision, most of the patterns of my life didn't change. But what I did notice right away was stories, tales, information about people um, that I didn't know that were tragic or painful. Um, up, up until I gave my life to Christ, I was aware and I could, I could be concerned intellectually, but I was not moved to tears by people I didn't know. I wasn't taken to that. The depth of the emotion it, it was not there. Um, and, and I remember being surprised, like, you know, walking by, I didn't have, I, in college, I never had a TV. 
but there were TV lounges. And I didn't watch a lot of TV, so it didn't really that matter that much to me. But I would see a news report or something, and I would catch myself being powerfully moved about something that I don't know these people, and I don't know anything about, I don't even know their backstory, I don't know what's going on, why is this bothering me? <laughs> and, and over time, I realized, well, this started happening after I gave my life to Christ. And I began to realize that's, he's, he's done in my heart something that, and I, I, people would not have described me as a harsh person or lacking compassion. I mean, I was, for people I knew, I was compassionate and, and caring and helpful and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't, I, I didn't connect as deeply with others um, as I do now. So that's the, the point being, um, Paul's investing himself in the people that are around him, regardless of his circumstances. They are not circumstances that determine the effectiveness and memory of our ministry. It is surrender and the willingness to be used in whatever place you are um, for the gospel. And Paul even says, hey, I wish everybody was like me. Well, not in chains, but <laughs> everything else about me, I wish that everybody knew except being in these chains. So that's that's kind of where we dive in. So I'm going to read some of the trial and then ask all of you to offer thoughts and ideas because I've done a lot of talking already. Um, so now we're before Festus. This is, remember, Felix dropped the ball, passed the buck, said he was going to do something, didn't do anything, and that shouldn't surprise us. Felix wasn't that great a guy. Not sure that any of these Roman leaders are, are um, paragons of virtue, but uh, Festus is perhaps not quite as bad, but anyway, it's no longer Felix, it's now Festus. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. It's actually down, Caesarea is north of Jerusalem. Uh, chapter 25, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, that would be helpful if I would say what chapter we're in. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um yeah, so it, it says up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. If you look at a map, it's actually south. However, in biblical speak, you always go up to Jerusalem. No matter where you are in the world, you ascend to the city of God. So it's always up to Jerusalem, regardless of what the geography says. Um, so it went, <clears throat> went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there if he has any, done anything wrong. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defense: "I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against Caesar." Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die, but if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. So let's stop there. Got a question. Yeah. How do they prove citizenship? Um, they took your word for it, <laughs> basically. <couldn't> okay. <laughs> What's that? They couldn't check if people knew that person. That's why they know Paul. They know where Paul came from. They could simply ask the king of Judea. And yeah. There. And so, generally speaking, you could follow through if you knew somebody was, because the world wasn't that big for them. Yeah. Especially where they were. 
Well, a couple chapters ago, somebody asked him where he's from. He said he's from Tarsus, and he just said, "Oh, okay, so you're yeah. you're Roman." Well, you know, one of the things that one of the things that is true in that world is yes, the size of the world is true, and and Romans. I mean, remember, Jesus's birth begins with a census, so. It isn't that they didn't keep records, but but one of the major differences is they believed that people would only say what was true. If you said, I'm from Tarsus, in at that time, in that culture, there was not a sense of we need to we need to confirm that, we need to prove it. If you had if you made the decision to speak that, it was really kind of unbelievable to them, to the Greek mind especially, that you would speak something that you knew wasn't true. That's well, if I'm you about to be flogged. I'll say I'm from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> there were there were very many people who, in, when push came to shove, you would need a couple of witnesses. So somebody could have said, "Wait a minute, he's not from Tarsus," and that would have stopped everything. And and then there there were ways, but uh, you know, uh, there is. The, it could be checked in Tarsus. Yeah. And so it it could be if necessary, it could be checked. But generally speaking, a Jewish law. Or more witnesses yeah. and and it would probably have taken quite a bit of time to check the records in Tarsus because mm -hmm. this would have been a person walking to Tarsus right. with the information checking it out and it's not really an, in anybody's best interest to get this it, it really everybody wins and it's pretty easy to tell you know those again around Jesus the, the trial of Jesus one of the things that that we hear is that they were trying to get two witnesses to tell the same story to accuse him of death. And they, you can't, lies are not consistent. And when you have two liars trying to testify for you, they're not going to tell the same story. And it's not that hard to figure out. They're not telling the truth. You can have two different experiences of an event, but it's fairly easy to figure out whether you, you were at that event and seeing it from a different perspective or whether you're making this all up. And so it... Two or more witnesses is not just a matter of saying, hey, would both of you t say that I didn't do this? That's a good place to start. But when the questioning begins, because everybody else thinks you're guilty of it, when they start pushing, the, the two witnesses no longer keep the same account, and they begin to see weaknesses in it. Um, Except for Jewish, the Jewish people. Their telling wasn't part of their culture. I mean, their stories all came from their scripture. Right. It didn't like, there wasn't like the Cinderella stories. That they didn't, that was Greek thought. That was that was, had nothing to do with Hebrew. So this particular culture that Paul was in wouldn't even thought of making up a story. Right. It just wasn't part of their who they were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, what's happened to us? Like <laughs> that's all we think. Now we're just <laughs> we have to have so right. many we're you know, right. checks and balances and verifications and we can't trust. I I think most of us do trust for the most part, but. Unfortunately, we don't really. Our government does not. I mean, any government in the world. I mean, the entire well, world system. What what we find is that <coughs> the truth doesn't change, but you, you can make up a whole lot of stories. Trying to, it it all it, all of the confusion comes from one simple logical impossibility. You can't prove something isn't. And so when I say I did do this. Prove that I didn't do it. That's logically impossible. The only way we can resolve it, if I say prove that I didn't do it, is for you to just give up. Because, because at the end of the day, you can't prove something isn't. You can only prove something is. Um, and so we have a lot of confusion because we make claims and, and, and waste time about it. The important thing here, though, is that Paul is completely at peace with the truth of his history. He doesn't pretend like he was ever that he was always a good guy. Um, a, a couple of things that are interesting. Um, does anybody else have a, a comment? I, I Jeff spoke first, and we ran off with that, but I keep talking. <laughs> he made the appeal to the emperor to be sent to the emperor was his way to get to Rome, but it keeps him in chains. You yeah. can't do that. Yeah. Yes. He did, and I think I think it's clear from some of his other writings that we have, that he was completely willing to allow those chains to, to be what got, to understand that's what God wanted from him, to get to Rome, and that meant being in chains, which, which is, you know, it kind of was, you know, imagine him getting up in the morning and saying, 
well, I'm still in chains, but I still know the gospel. I still have a, a witness to give. I still have a message to share. I still have people to influence. So as long as I'm doing that, but, you know, but yeah, he would have, would have been a long trip and it would have been a, a trip. He would have been, and we don't know exactly how bound he was. Um, there was, a, there was more of an honor system then again, you couldn't move that fast. So if you tried to run away, you're, you know, you're not going to hop on a motorcycle and take off into the distance. People are going to see where you went. Um, but, you know, you don't have a whole lot of resources. So was he actually bound to somebody all the time? Probably not. But he was under house arrest, whatever that meant. It was he, he was restricted. Well, on a much milder note, I mean, look at you. I mean, you're you're bound. You go where they tell you to go, and they tell yeah. you to go there. Yeah. And you know, it's it's yeah. your hair to preach the gospel wherever they send you. Yes, and that's a good same, point. Same kind of thing here. Yeah. And, and most of us are in chains, yeah, <laughs> to some degree yeah. or another. Right. And and recognizing that we don't need to battle this limitation. You know, I I am I have been blessed. I. I don't know that I can take credit for it, although it is important. It's important to me to develop the thinking, which is very simply, I'm not sure if I'm the best pastor at New Leaf United Methodist Church, but I know this. I'm the best one you've got today because I am the one you've got today. So for today, whatever it is that I do, I need to act like I'm the best pastor that they have here because that's the only pastor. Except you drag Lynn with you. <laughs> <laughs> they say, listen, we could, we could, I do not feel she's not bound. <laughs> well, it's, it, it is, but you're right. We can worry about going to work and, you know, but, but we can also witness and we can serve. People pay attention to what we do regardless of the context. If, if we're, if we're living right, if we're honest and caring, um, you know, and the other thing I think is important to recognize, very few people have more than a dozen really intimate relationships, people that know them well and that they know well. I mean, no matter how limited you could be, and I've heard these, a couple of guys in the prison have essentially commented on this, that whether they're on, <laughs> on the street or in prison, how many people could they really influence? with their lives. You know, it's a limited number of people. So being in prison does not limit their ability to, to be a witness. It's just a different location. But even on the streets, you know, I've heard one guy was saying, you know, I had my people and their people, and I could only hang out with and, and be around my people. And if I wasn't part of their people, I couldn't be with them. And it's a, you know, group gets smaller. And, um, and the, so, so the limitations around us, we need to look past them. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit helps Paul see. Yeah, he says, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to escape death. I mean, that, you know, there's a, a powerful faith in that. Yeah. There's a story, and I don't recall which war it was, but the Christians were kind of together in a room, one room, and, you know, together with the doors locked, and because they were, they were being hunted. It, it, it was dangerous to be that. And they were sitting there, and the door burst open, and five or six guys were mass you know, things and, and rifles and they said you know if, if you really believe in God stay and if you don't get out because we're killing whoever stays and about half the people got up and took off the, yeah. the rest sat there just sat there they weren't going to deny God or right. deny Christ yeah. and the guys shut the door took off all their stuff put the rifles down and said we want to live and they left mm -hmm. oh wow yeah. so it was, you know, it's a, naturally it's a true story and I don't remember enough of the details about it but the point here is it's the same thing as Paul is saying. You know, you know I'm not trying to escape that. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to give you truth. And that's what these men were, were yeah. doing there. They weren't trying to escape the death of that. They were they were telling the truth of who they were. Yeah, and, and you know so God spoke to Paul directly and said, I got the plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so of course if you hear from God directly, like, you know, in that dream that he had, and God sort of affirmed Paul in what he was doing. And so Paul said, I'm taken care of. I, you know, God has the plan, and I'm just here to do it, and it will all work out. So he heard directly. You know, Paul, when he writes, I mean, when you read Paul writing it, whether I'm, you know, alive or dead, I, I, I mean, because I'm dead, I'm with God. If I'm, you know, I'm yeah. if I'm alive, then I'm free. Win win. So, yeah, it was a. I think that's me. I think it all kind of starts right here.
Well, and you know, a couple of things. One, that's that story about the the per persecution is a large part of how we developed our New Testament canon because these letters, as they were circulated, were in the possession of of believers, and it was dangerous and punishable by death to be a believer. And so, kind of the internal conversation was: Listen, if they show up and they say surrender the surrender the documents that speak of Christ or surrender your lives, which one do we die for? We're not going to die for everything that's been said. What ones do we all agree are true and authoritative and powerful and consistent? So, so what, what has survived in our New Testament it is largely the stuff that early Christians were willing to die for. The information that they would say, I'm not going to surrender it. Take my life. Be they would they they didn't die for a lot of stuff that was floating around, and they and they chose to die for for what we have left. And that's you know, um, I think the other thing, if you look at 26 verse six, um, and Paul's confidence that God has given him a sense of the mission and that he's still making a, a, an impact, he he says, and now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial. And it's the promise of the resurrection. It's clear here that when he says to live as Christ, to die as gain, it's clear that Paul has already begun to live an eternal existence. He sees himself as inheriting the hope of a promise of resurrection. It's not just salvation and sanctification it's not, it's, it doesn't end with this mortal life, which is, again, not everybody saw afterlife as something uh, positive. Not everybody saw af afterlife as something that even existed around Paul's time. Um, but for Paul, he, he owns the, you know, the risen Christ has said, listen, I've got this, this message. He's encountered Christ and he, and he believes it and he sees it. And his hope is based not in what happens to him in this life, but in the inheriting the promise of the resurrection. He and calls, he calls it a race, too. So, you know, he knows that he's got a limited time. So he's yeah. got to hurry. And and everything he does, even when he's chained and in prison, you know, he doesn't shut up. Right. He, he just Good point. He keeps it going. Yeah, he does see it as having a, a, a end time in this, in this in terms of human time. Right. Yeah, he, he, call, he sees it as a race. Good point. Even if you had Romans that they believed in heaven and hell, I mean, Elysium feels like Elysium. They believed in that. So it wasn't a big jump for them. Where there was a big debate going on for the Jews right. whether or not that existed. But for the Romans, the, the Greeks in general, that, that was that was easy for them to accept. So it was a point that he could work with that's you know, where they it's kind of a level that they could work with. Yeah, he didn't have to right, with with the with the Greeks and the Romans, the the ones who weren't Jewish, his his claim of an eternity with Christ wasn't something they would talk about. They would accept that. Okay, that's what your claim is. And and then his witness can become, here's how you get there. Whereas with with some of the some of the um Jews at the time, the argument was there isn't anything after life, which really takes the wind out of the sails of resurrection. Yeah. Yes. And and what added stress to it is the 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 cultural dynamic that for um, generations the Jewish people have been able to exist in in an, you know their kind of in, in inbred community their their sort of internal community doing things their way in the context of the, of the Greeks and the Romans without getting too disturbed as long as they didn't cause trouble if you cause trouble and and at any given moment, you know, the only thing that's worse than blaspheming, blaspheming God, would be if you happened to catch a Roman emperor on the wrong day who wanted you to believe that they were God, <laughs> and and suggested that there was another God. Yeah, well, you know, that that could do you in as well. So they're trying to protect their kind of favored nation status with the Romans. They're trying to keep their people consistent. If you think about the very basic realities. The leaders in the temple, you know, depended on the gifts of the people to provide their their living, to you know, provide for the for the temple and and all of that. So, yeah, there is there's all kinds of turmoil happening around, and Paul becomes this kind of 
island of calm in the midst of this. I don't know if anyone else gets it, but when I when I think about Paul, especially in his writings later on, and certainly Peter, I Peter never gives me a sense of that guy could bring peace anywhere. <laughs> I I think of Peter as that guy could take anything peaceful and turn it into a ruckus. Paul, you know, yes and no, but but in 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 Acts anyway, Paul comes across to me as somebody who brings peace and calm to the situations he's in. Well, God brought him that peace and calm that they vision. So he went into this already. Okay, I'm good. I can do. I can do this. Yeah. I mean, being that he he was lean, he'd been with the Gentiles, he was leaning into what would be a favored belief of the Romans and that. that put him the people would not the general people would start not liking him because the Jewish people didn't like you to become Roman. They had enough problem there. The King Agrippa was that's actually grandson of Herod, but great grandson of Herod. But he was a vassal king to the Emperor. He had control over the temple and he had the right to appoint the priests, the high priests. Mm-hmm. So he take the a Roman king who take literally taken over what would have been the Jewish rights to do what they should have done from God. So anything that leaned into the Jewish or leaned away from the Jewish into the possible Greek or you know Gentile world was really important to them. And that's why they wanted to get rid of him. He was becoming too Greek. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he could he and and when it says um that Agrippa called together, uh, you know, one of the things that, that King Agrippa does pretty well is behave as a leader, although he could make a unilateral decision. Um, he he clearly invites the popular leaders um, to get their opinion. And, and behind closed doors, the bottom line is, if he had, if he had, if he felt that there was any evidence whatsoever that Paul had done something worthy of death. Law yeah. Right, and Roman law, and he and he would have he would not have most likely not have gotten in trouble if he had summarily ex- executed Paul and said we're done with it, because at this point Paul's not that important, and and the Roman Empire isn't going to care very much, and the the you know that it, it's you know part of it is don't bring a case before the emperor that isn't worthy of the emperor's time, and so you know any any reason for Agrippa or even Festus to say that just to execute the guy and let's get on with it. You know, they could have taken that. And I think that in addition to knowing that God's, that God has, that Christ has sent him on this mission, I think that Paul probably is aware that the, the, the Roman leadership around him don't have the guts to execute him summarily. That he's, they're, he's turning the world upside down. Yes, he is. <laughs> I just think he feels so protected by God that because God told him that there was a yeah. plan, and, and Paul says, right. "So God is, he's not going to let the, these yeah. people kill me because that's not his plan. His plan is for me to go forward and yeah, the gospel." Yeah. Yeah, he knew. Yes. Yeah, I really get the sense, and I think that's part of it. Is that you know, Paul's being accused of creating these this discord and 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 riots but when when the leaders experience him he's not doing that you know w- another thing that paul doesn't do that the jewish accusers do paul doesn't gather an entourage he doesn't call all of his supporters and say hey listen get the word out paul's going before the you know the king tomorrow he's going to be tried and it's going to be you know part of it is a court of public opinion Paul didn't call together people to stand on his behalf. It, it keeps, and this is the first time I've noticed that, you know, talk about reading the Bible again. There's the Asian Jews that are always causing the trouble, and they're <laughs> following him around. Yeah. And and they're the ones that are turning the world upside down, not Paul. Yeah. You know, they're up there Good point. eating the drums, and, and they, they follow him around, except they didn't come here. When the real trial happened, they, they, yeah. they scattered. And, and, they, and, the, and the, you know, it, the illusion here to... You know, hey, they would you come back to Jerusalem with me? Well, the reason they wanted that was because they they knew they could they could capture and kill Paul on the road between, you know, Caesarea and Jerusalem. They didn't want a fair trial in Jerusalem, and Paul knew that, and uh, clearly King Agrippa knew that as well. That the, 
So a small thing in here. If you put it in Jewish law, if you take someone to court and they're proven innocent, whatever, you said that they did this, but they're proven innocent, you receive the, uh, the punishment that you wanted that person to get. Yeah. So if you take these people, if he goes back to Jerusalem and they're found, if he's found innocent, these men that were standing against him, yeah. deserve the death penalty. And that's scary. That's why they scattered. They didn't come to this thing. Right. Everybody knows the law. Because yeah. Their yeah. Mm. And 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 hence the reason they're trying to do it in back channels. <laughs> you know, they don't they and and you know the other contrast here and and it's clear in the New Testament and it's clear with Christ. Paul is doing is saying very simply everything I'm telling you is true and in the open. I'm not hiding anything. That's the same thing Christ said. Yeah. I'm preaching. Yeah. I'm preaching. Yeah. I, wh I'm preaching. Why are you upset? I'm, I'm, I haven't, I haven't, I've told you what I preach about. I'm preaching it where I preach it. I haven't argued anything, any of the things that you're going to accuse me of. I, it, fine, bring it out there. I, I have not been trying to hide anything. I'm not ashamed of anything I've done or said. And that's, you know, that's, that's Paul's attitude as well. This is the truth of who I've been. This is my history, completely honest. And he actually, um, in this speech to to Agrippa, he expands. We learn we learn more about Paul's nefarious activities here than we've known before. In Acts, in in chapter nine, when we hear about his conversion, up until then, the only thing we really know about is he was causing trouble in Jerusalem, and then he'd been gotten given the the freedom to go to Damascus, and we know just of Stephen being the one person that he was really present for the stoning of. But now we hear that it was a fairly common thing for Paul, apparently, that he was doing a whole lot more of this troublemaking. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's before the king who could do something about it. So he's not hiding anything, and that, that strengthens his, his position in terms of being a witness instead of being, you know, trying to find a scapegoat. Um, if I'm guilty of anything deserving death, I don't refuse to die. But if they're not true, hand me over to Caesar. And it, this is kind of like, if you, if you watch cop shows, this is Paul's lawyered up. <laughs> the, the minute he says, I want to see Caesar, it's everything's done. No, we're not going anywhere from here. If he says, you want to see Caesar? We'll talk about it a little bit more. But the bottom line is this. Once we know you're a citizen and you say you want to see Caesar, that's where you're going. We're not going to worry about it. And, and that I'm sure is another part of the reason uh, or of the dynamic that allows Paul to witness. Because now his, his fate is not in the hands of the local leaders. Now, nothing's going to happen to Paul except they're going to take care of him. And to a certain degree, if, if, he is, if he appeals to Caesar and it's Agrippa's job to get him to see Caesar safely, Paul now is under the protection of the Roman government. It, it is not in Agrippa's best interest or Festus's best interest for Paul to get murdered after he says, I appeal to Caesar. If you appeal to Caesar, then Caesar's the one that gets to pronounce that. If he had summarily executed Paul before he asked that, then he might have gotten away with it. But now they got to make sure he makes it there. So, But he does say, I'm, I am now standing before, kind of like I'm already in Caesar's court. Oh, yeah, in a sense. Yeah. And when he says, are you willing to go, it's, he's kind of saying, I guess, but I'm already here. Yeah. That's how I took it when I was reading. Well, and, because and then later it says, you know, they didn't even have a charge. It's so emotional, like, to Caesar you will go. But then later, I have no charge to write. Uh, what am I going to write? Like, well, uh oh I don't have anything on this guy. And it's this is kind of bad leadership right there. Well, yeah, it, <laughs> really this is the confusion of the office change. We have Festus who says, hey, I'm going to resolve this. And then he doesn't. And then to do a favor for the Jews, he says, well, I'll just leave him in prison. So, so then Felix inherits the problem. No, he, the other way around. Right? Yeah, that's Felix right. Felix, him, and then Festus the inher in inherits the problem. But because Festus wasn't there, he doesn't really know what the charges are. They haven't been written out yet. There isn't, you know, there's just confusion. And then the same thing, you know, finally Agrippa says, you know, wait a minute. If we're going to, he's appealed to Caesar. I think Paul is reminding them of that, you know. I appealed to Caesar to somebody else, but I just want to remind you, I did appeal to Caesar, and that's why I'm here. You know, and and but but we don't have a charge. What are you appealing? Because it's so unclear. They don't really have a charge, and and 
what I think Agrippa really wants is for Paul to deny the charges and for Agrippa to just dismiss the whole thing and get rid, you know, end the thing and tell the Jews to go home and behave and tell Paul to fly under the radar for a bit and not cause too much trouble and let's just get back to everyday life. But that's not Paul's mission. So Festus consults King Agrippa and go on. A few days later, King versus this chapter 25, verse 13. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over any man before he has faced his accusers and has had an opportunity to defend himself against their charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a lo loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stay in trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He said, tomorrow you'll hear him. So any comments about that section? Well, when I was studying this last night in a different Bible, <laughs> I wonder who the heck is Bernice? We keep bringing her up. Yeah, that's Bernice. a fascinating, I have quite a lot of footnotes yeah, on I, I, her. I, I, yeah. This Bible has She's a footnote. She's a fascinating right? person. She's uh, what, what, so enlightened. What made me think about it? Well, okay, I'll just read this. The oldest daughter of Herod Agrippa I, Bernice was twice widowed before entering into an incestuous relationship with her brother, Herod Agrippa II, which is this guy. So it's yeah. his sister slash wife. Yeah. Uh, despite the scandal of this relationship, she was frequently presented as Herod's queen on official occasions. And, and the way I was thinking of is, you know, the, the man is the head of the household and she is the neck that turns the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And that's why she's so, because she's mentioned three times in here. And I think yeah. you don't get mentioned three times in the Bible. Mm, that's not some significant. Yeah. No, that's true. My Bible just said rumors that she was living in incest. She also then married somebody to prove it wasn't, you know, like to try to look good. But sounds like it was confirmed. I didn't know if it really was just brother, sister or what that was. But she... Well, and I, I think, too, unfortunately, um, because of some of the social dynamics, instead of giving a, giving a fair, not, um, fair voice to women and respect for what they might offer, um, they, were, they were granted insignificant or seemingly insignificant requests that were less costly, kind of humoring them. All right, we'll let you, you, Bernice wants to see this guy, we'll go and see this guy. Not not really giving her any real power or any real respect, but sort of like, okay, we'll throw her a bone. If she wants this, we'll let her have this. It's not I, it's not costing me anything, you know, to go and listen to this guy. Um, and I, I think it's interesting the way Festus says about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. The message of the resurrection is still at the center of this conversation. Mm -hmm. No matter how much noise the the Jews and others make around Paul, his witness has been singular. And it's important to recognize that Paul doesn't engage every conversation about every claim. He stays to the message, to the message of his witness, and that witness is about the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whom Paul has encountered personally and can verify has come back from the dead because Paul's encountered him. And that message is preserved in the midst of all this cacophony. This is how God's working through us to bring the message. And that's the lesson he learned in Thessalonica when he went off on a different track and got booed, yeah. <laughs> booted out. And yeah. so he said, after that, I'm only going to talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, him crucified. and that's what he does. Yeah.
Yeah, that's right. It's it's also informative to realize that most of the New Testament letters we have from Paul, except Romans, are being written or have been written. At, we get to this point, Paul's been doing ministry for a while when we get him to, to Agrippa toward the end here. I find it interesting that at the beginning, you know, when it says King Agrippa and Bernice, uh, I think you guys said it, it came to pay their respects to Festus, but the message says that they came to welcome Festus to his new post. So Festus is new on the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No wonder he's, and all of a sudden, Paul mm -hmm. lands in his lap, <laughs> right. so yeah. to speak. So no wonder he's being so cautious. He didn't yeah. really ask these people to come either, according to what I was No, they wouldn't. It's just yeah. like they were there. He just kind of lucked into it. Like, oh, yeah. good, I can just pass this along. Yeah. Get him to weigh in. What a <laughs> blessing there. Like, well, you know, it was, you know, it was a concept of networking. You have a lot of government officials, and, and they don't have websites and emails and Zoom calls. They they networked by when there was when there were new leaders in the area. One of the things that, you know, part of the reason for the Roman roads road system and law was to communicate, but communication was carried in person, and and so it was important that that the emperor and all the people underneath him recognize the chain of command, and so. You know, Agrippa coming to interact with Festus is partially respecting Festus as new on the job, partially giving Festus a chance to offer his praise to Agrippa, but also sort of establishing who's in charge here. And you know, th this is <laughs> I'm I'm aware of what you're doing, and I'm present. You know, Festus passes the buck, but uh, you know, some of this is just the way they did um, business. Yeah. Um, they came to greet him. They came to greet him. Yeah, he's new. He's new. Um, so we'll continue. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. He's trying to bring together a coalition. He's trying to make a decision, trying to get the crowd to own a decision that he won't make himself, essentially. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man? The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here about him in, uh, in, and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. What a sissy way of saying kill him. <laughs> I mean, can you tell the guy's a politician? <laughs> He's blaming everybody else for something he won't say. Um, Shouting that he ought to ought not to live any longer. I found he had not he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. Do my job for me so I don't have to. That's what he's saying. For I think it's unreasonable to send a prisoner without specifying the charges. And I think that, that Festus probably has his fingers crossed that Agrippa will say, forget the charges, just kill the guy and let's get on with business. But that's not what happens. So we can come up with something in the nature of a charge that will hold water. <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> that exactly. what your says. Yeah. Let's make something up there. Well, yes, that's right. Something in the nature of a charge that will hold water. Yeah, that is it, exactly. I imagine that, that Augustus wouldn't be happy if they sent him all the way to, and had to sit him down in front of him and say, what, you know? What, I alone? You don't have a jerk against him. Well, yeah, that's why they're stalling. If every citizen of Rome could appeal to Caesar, it'd be like if every citizen of the United States could appeal to the president. I know, it's weird right. that Caesar they, actually they, listened to those cases. Uh, yeah, an awful long line of people waiting to see him. And if you got up there and said, well, we got nothing. That would be <laughs> well, a big okay. and it And it also happened not by organization. Because they, they you know, all, this, all of the legal proceedings had to be done in person, which meant you know, at the, at the time, the, the Agrippa would have been, uh, you know, a traveling. They, they, and, and England carried on this con, this um, tradition of uh, the officer of the assize. They would kind of like a circuit riding preacher would take communion to different churches around. The the court would move. The the king's court would move around the country and hear the cases before it. But weather and sickness and food and other things, you know, 
plus politics and meeting local, you know, there, there was no real schedule for when you would see the king or when you would, you know, getting to Rome doesn't give you any sense of when you're going to get to see the emperor. You get there, you present your case, and who knows how long it takes. The emperor could be out, could be gone for a year before he comes back. So it, it, there's really nothing definite, which is one of the reasons that they say, you know, we've got to come up with a charge against him, but they can't. And and Paul cannot, they, another option would have been for Paul to say to Agrippa, listen, I'm willing to stop making a big deal out of this if you're willing to let the charges drop and give me freedom. You know, and, and Agrippa could have said, okay, that's fine, Paul, listen, you stay out of Jerusalem and we'll, we'll leave you alone. And to the Jews, you okay with him? Will you leave him alone if he'll stay out of Jerusalem? And they could have said yes. I mean, that, that would have been a reasonable political solution, except that Paul wouldn't let it happen. <laughs> He's not, he's not going to give in to any conversation about like, sending you back to Jerusalem so we can work this thing out. That's not, it, he's not doing that because it's not what God's called him to do. Um, going back to the Greek there, um, I, it's kind of interesting. It's just like being misplaced, calling, crying out is not necessary or worthy for them to live. It's not even necessary or worthy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessary for us. We don't need him and he's not worthy. <laughs> Not, not necessary and not worthy. Yeah, interesting. Um, so I'll continue. We only have a few minutes, but let's jump into 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So again, Paul is observing the court decorum. He's protect, he's, he is behaving respectably, even though the charges are not real. Even though it's unfair, Paul is behaving in a peaceful, organized, ordered way, not causing trouble in, in any way. He's not screaming and arguing. He's waiting for his turn. He receives his turn, and he says, thank you. you know, um, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are so well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Now he says, I know you know what I know what you know, and you know that I know what you know, so let's make sure that you act like you know what you know. So, <laughs> the Jews all know. <laughs> I can't. I can't say it again. <laughs> That's the, the whole point of it, is you can't repeat it. <laughs> the Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child and from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they're willing, that according to the strict sec strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee, and now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. Paul owns his Jewish heritage, and it, this, is, this may be his most powerful declaration that Jesus is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament, and this is not a new sect, this is not a new thing, this is the fulfillment of the promise. I mean, Paul's very clear about that here. This is the promise to the 12 tribes. O king, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Then that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. He's talking about a past obsession in a very focused and orderly, non-obsessive way right now. You can clearly see the change in, in, in Paul's character. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goad. So this is the first addition to the accounts that we've heard previously. He's added that Jesus also said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. 
I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. And we go on from there. I want to make just point out a couple of things because we're running short on time that have changed in uh, his account. And I, I think I said this in the second service, but maybe not the first service, or maybe the first and not the second. Th this expansion of the conversion experience is not evidence that he's making it up. It's evidence that it's a maturing experience and he's understanding it more deeply. The first time you have a powerful experience like that, you get the gist of it, but it's it, it is a it becomes part of your character, and as you reflect on it, and it and your appreciation from it deepens, um, you know you have a richer sense of it. And I really think um, I, I like I, I it, this time through touched by the phrase, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. That's exactly what happened to Paul. He was blinded by this. And and he went to the to the believers in Damascus, and Ananias opened his eyes, restored his sight. Paul is talking as a Jewish person to the Jewish people about the need to be aware that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. It, this is not Paul doing a new thing, and Paul's owning it. It's not. It's their eyes. It's also his eyes being opened, and turned from darkness to light. But the power. And, and this is the thing, receive, receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is critical because the atonement for sin is the stumbling block for Jews in you know, being in complete obedience to God. The entire sacrificial system is designed to atone for sins, to achieve, to achieve you know, justification, to, to be forgiven for those sins, but also the reason for forgiveness from sins is because they're called to be a holy nation serving a holy God. And, and the sacrificial system has failed completely in bringing that to pass. The system of laws and sacrifices of the, the requirements and the consequences and the process to do that in the temple to achieve atonement and, and get on equal footing with God has been given all the time it needs and it has not worked. And so we are sanctified now, Paul understands, by Christ. He's the one that sanctifies the nation, fulfills the law. And that's exactly what Jesus says he comes to do. When he says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, go ahead, no. That's what, that's what Paul said, and he knew the scripture. And he saw through Christ, when he started looking at the, who the man was, saw him in the scripture. Oh, this is what it is. This is yeah. the whole scripture, the, all the systems, all these these festivals, all this stuff is a reflection of Christ. Yeah. And he is a fulfillment of those things. Yeah. That's what we get in the New Testament. Yeah. So he had it all. It just was like the light strikes you. It's like when you read the Old Testament, it's like, I have no idea what this is. But when you get in the New Testament, you start seeing that. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. that's from there. That's from so, yeah. yeah. It's like putting those jigsaw puzzle together. You got all the pieces. But you don't got the picture. Yeah. And you talk about the sacrificial system. You know, the original sacrificial system, as you mentioned, was Adam and Eve in the garden. Yeah. Right. But, then, but then the very next generation, they blew it. Yeah, that's right. With Cain and Abel. Yeah. So and now we've got millions of Jews over thousands of miles. And how's that going to work? You know, when there were four people, they couldn't do it. Yeah, that's right. And Cain got the warning. Right. <laughs> Adam and Eve were told not to do it, and they, they screwed that up. Cain's getting ready to slay Abel, and, and, Jesus, and God says to him, listen, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Trust me when I tell you, it's not going to end well. Right. I recommend that you not let sin in. Right. It's knocking at the door of your heart. Don't let it in. If you do, life is not going to get better for you. And indeed, life doesn't get better. Um, but yes, they, our place among those sanctified by faith in Christ, Christ fulfills that entire law. And that's, and that's why Paul has such a passion. He can't stop caring about his people. Because what he did on the road, what he was doing before he got to, to the road to Damascus was still a heartfelt defense of the God that he cared, that he loved, that he studied, that he understood. He, he, re, he recognized the need for all of that system and the beauty of it. 
And then he finds that there is one who can fulfill it when Paul's aware of generations of his people not being, I mean, part of the, part of what we don't maybe fully appreciate when Paul talks about himself as a leader in the Jewish people, as a, as a Pharisee among Pharisees, that includes owning in his heart the entire history of his people. They didn't go back and, and refer to the history books when they needed to refer to them. We have the Jewish history because they remembered it, not because, I mean, they, they, so, so when Paul talks about this, about this sanctification that we have yearned for, he's talking about the entire history of his people is on his heart. It's not just today we can't fulfill the law. It is, I realize how long our people have suffered and struggled to get right with you, God. And now you send someone to make it right. And in Paul's experience, Jesus has made it right. And that's the, the nature of Paul's appeal is not just for his own life, but he is, he is connected to Jewish history and, and the ancient truth. Well, and you see, he speaks of that in other, in other times, other places, but it's really on his heart. And that's why he gives this heartfelt speech. And it's now a little bit afternoon, so... We will have to wrap up. It's hard because I hate that he's, and they literally say at the end of this, he's not even guilty of anything. Right. But then they say because he, and you had, I hate that he has to be in prison, but I know that's what he wants. Yeah. That's so weird. It's such a weird thing to think of. Like, I know that in the end, it has to be what God wants, and that's yes. what he did. That's his ticket to Rome. Yeah. yeah. But I hate that he has to go like that. But, you know, it, at the same time, there's another another way to, to see it. That's not guilty. One of the, one of the, Great virtues of um, great evangelists, John Wesley, Billy Graham, and, our, and my dad's generation. Um, Billy Graham was not content to get people converted and leave them to flounder on their own. He, he, when he brought crusades to towns, he made certain that there were local churches and congregations that were available to follow up for anybody that gave their lives to Christ. He did not abandon converts. He was clear, and Wesley was as well, and many others, that that. Conversion is one thing, but it also needs to include training and, and encouragement and discipling. And that's what Paul's doing with these. He's in, the, in the, the palace. He's in the leadership. But there are all these other people that are hearing this whose lives can be changed. And Paul has the chance in his imprisonment to give a deep dive into the Jewish scriptures, a deep dive into the promise of Messiah. I mean, the, what, what we appreciate knowing the promise of Messiah and seeing Christ, Paul now imparts to many others in this time of imprisonment. They wouldn't have known anything about Messiah. The, the, all of the people, you know, from this point on in Paul's experience, pretty much everybody he spends time with are people that could never, couldn't begin to imagine what it means that Christ is Messiah, let alone that it's a fulfillment of a promise. So remember, Paul says, it's because of the promise that I'm here. And they need to know what that promise is to appreciate it, to receive Christ. This time of imprisonment for Paul is a, a powerful, valuable time. I, I, I think it's more important to us maybe than what we realize. So thank you for that, Lynn. And since you had the last statement besides me, you can close really? us in prayer. I had the last statement. <laughs> Not really. I said be, I, my, footnote, my footnote I was it. besides me. <laughs> but you can pray. Then you do get the last word. Father, we do always thank you for all of what we see and every single time we come together, what we know without a doubt is how much you love us and how much you want us to have a relationship with you. And we just ask that you help us to walk that this week and that you give us opportunities. And uh, we just thank you and praise you for this time and for this awesome Bible that we have to learn more about you. and. We just can look at it whenever we want. We're so grateful for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.